acknowledge um, in a special acknowledgement of the First Peoples, namely that uh, McGill University is situated on traditional Haudenosaunee territory. Speaking to this highlights a deep recognition of the people who came before the earliest European colonies were established here. It also recognizes the indigenous people who continue to live nearby. We humbly say Nayawan for the use of their land. The spiritual, cultural, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children in residential schools across Canada is the subject of this afternoon's panel. For the location and context of our discussion at university accentuates the particular focus of our reflections on healing, forgiving, and preventing abuse, namely the question of how Canada's institutions of higher learning may respond to the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. At this point, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce our distinguished panelists who are here this afternoon in the order in which they will be speaking. First, Professor Ronald Neeson, who holds the Catherine A. Pearson Chair in Civil Society and Public Policy in the Faculties of Law and Arts, as well as a Canada Research Chair in the Anthropology of Law. His research interests include Indigenous Peoples and Human Rights. Among his many publications in this area, he is the author recently of The Rediscovered Self, Indigenous Identity and Cultural Justice, and of Truth and Indignation, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission on Indian Residential Schools. We are also joined today by Dr. Marie Wilson, who is a commissioner in Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Her work on behalf of Indigenous communities includes launching the first daily television news service for Northern Canada, developing the Arctic Winter Games and the True North Concert Series, lobbying for the recruitment of Aboriginal talent and promotion of Aboriginal literacy. She assisted the South African Broadcasting Corporation with training initiatives during the country's transition to democracy just as the South African community was establishing its own Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Michael Loft is an academic associate in the Faculty of Social Work at McGill University. His research and teaching has focused on First Nations issues, healing, and social work practice. He is an intergenerational survivor whose father and wife both attended residential schools. He himself attended an Indian day school for seven years. He is a member of Indigenous Access McGill and has two decades of practice experience in child protection with individuals and families who attended Indian residential schools. The Right Honourable Paul Martin Jr. is the former Liberal Prime Minister of Canada. Under his leadership, the Canadian government reached an historic deal with Aboriginal people of Canada to eliminate the existing funding gaps in health, education, and housing, known as the Kelowna Accord. After leaving politics, Mr. Martin founded the Martin Aboriginal Education Initiative, focusing on elementary and secondary education for Aboriginal students, and the Capital for Aboriginal Prosperity and Entrepreneurship Fund, an investment fund investigating, or rather investing in Aboriginal business. And finally today, our moderator, who's seated in the center, is Professor Philip Oxhorn, founding director of the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill. Professor Oxhorn's areas of interest include the relationship between short-term conflict resolution and longer-term goals of development and democratization in fragile and post-complex states. At this point, I'd like to turn the mic over to Professor Oxhorn, who will explain how this afternoon's panel discussion will take place. Thank you. So it's a pleasure for me to be sitting on this August panel as moderator. It's pretty straightforward. Each of the, the speakers will speak for 15 minutes in the order in which they're presented, and that will leave some time for some questions and answers. This should be quite interesting. Thank you for joining us. So we're on your first. Thank you very much. Tout le monde. Je suis très honoré d'être invité ici pour parler avec ce, cette, 
cet événement euh, avec des co-participants si And thank you very much for coming. I just wanted to, uh, I know that uh, we're being asked to um, speak informally, um, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to do that and to maybe cover a bit of the ground about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, and my place in study. Uh, so I brought a few slides along. Um, my position at McGill is as an anthropologist who's been appointed to a position in the faculty of law. Um, so I'm aware of the challenges facing the university and facing the coverage of this topic because in the two areas of my appointment, there's a kind of, there's a strong difference of academic culture. In the faculty of law, there tends to be an orientation towards getting things done. Uh, I see this in the, in the applicants that are there, uh, I'm on the application committee, and my goodness, people are really motivated to change the world when they come to this faculty. And we begin with the people that we select for, for, for the education here. Anthropologists are quite different. They're ambiguous about activism. There's a more critical orientation. People are sometimes criticized, the discipline as a whole is sometimes criticized for tearing things down. Um, criticizing things too much, not being constructive. So even though anthropologist has its activists, there's a debate in anthropology about the place of activism, about wanting to change the world. And there's ambiguity about organization and institutions and political power as a whole. So how do I approach the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as somebody whose uh, position come, is sort of schizophrenic to begin with? Um, I think that my orientation um, begins with a basic division between different approaches to law. There's the approach that uses the knowledge that we get through anthropology through doing ethnographic long-term research that tries to serve the law in bringing about change. And there's another side that uses anthropology to offer critique of organizations. I've done both, and I leave it to you to perhaps see where my approach to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is. My approach to the TRC was as a researcher, which took a little bit more of a distance approach. I was interested in what, in this, in this in instance, what the law does, what its effects are. Not how I can apply the law better or make the law more efficient, but to look over the long term at what the social consequences of a legal phenomenon were. So, I summoned my resources. I went to all of the, all seven of the national events except that in Vancouver, which I looked at online. I think I had about 15 research assistants. They didn't all go to the same event. I had one in Iqaluit, um, uh, uh, and I had five in Montreal where I didn't have to pay travel expenses. And I went to community events, and I looked at the variety of things that were happening in these very complex, uh, uh, very complex process, which was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Oops, I'm not, it's not moving forward, and I'm not quite sure how to do this. So and Naomi Nwoku's understanding of TRCs is an example of the approach to law. She's not an anthropologist that I know, but it's an approach to law that looks at it critically, that looks at the way the grand, as she calls it, the grand narrative of human rights violations identifies purpose, perpetrators and victims within a specific episode. It creates 
classifications that are entrenched in the truth time space and unwittingly restrains victims and perpetrators' voices within imposed categories, obscuring the complexity of the ethnic antipathy narrative. She's looking in, in particular at eth ethnicity-based uh, conflict. She looks at the restraint in the truth-telling space, which results in a disproportionate focus on the what, where, and how of particular violations, which she says undermines the repair of social relations in the long term. She looks at the sensationalizing narrative of victimization, which she sees it as being, in some cases, in some truth commissions, aimed at seizing global attention, but ignores a more me measured investigation into the why of violations. So that's the starting point. It's the sort of critical view of truth commissions as a phenomenon and looking at what they do. First, the essential facts of Indian residential schools, which many of you know, and I will move through quickly. Um, there were some 140 <coughs> schools in operation, some 150,000 students who were incarcerated in them. The number of students alive today is more or less 86,000. The cost of the common experience payments, which were given to everybody who attended school, whether they experienced harm or not, was at some $1.6 billion as of a few years ago when these payments ended. And the cost of the independent assessment process for those who experienced harm is at some $3.5 billion. This makes it one of the largest settlement agreements. It makes it the largest settlement agreement in Canada and one of the largest in history uh, in the world. Canada's TRC is distinct in some ways. It's not transitional justice in that there was no civil war, there was no, um, there was no apartheid, there was no transition from one kind of regime to another, no revolution. It's an outcome of litigation originating from claimants, not out of a widely recognized conflict. It's almost exclusively focused on harm to children. It's significantly concerned with the harms that have resulted, the emotional harms, the trauma that has resulted from experience in the schools, including intergenerational trauma. And its mandate, its terms of reference in the Indian Residential School Settlement Act, unlike some TRCs, <coughs> exclude judicial authority. We see this exclusion of judicial authority in Schedule N of the Indian Residential School Settlement Act, which established the mandate of the Truth Commission. It shall not hold formal, hearing, formal hearings, nor act as a public inquiry. Um, it, um, cannot make rec it cannot make recommendations that uh, result in findings or the expression of any conclusion or recommendation regarding the misconduct of any person unless such findings or information has been established. I noticed in the, some of the proceedings of the TRC, and Dr. Mills Wilson might be able to confirm this, that some people um, giving their statements actually violated this rule uh, and wanted to name some of the people that um, had, had, had uh, harmed them in, in the schools. Now, one of the things that struck me is the narrow limitation of the idea of the Indian residential school and how people understood it who attended TRC events. And we see this focus on the federal, federally funded, federally mandated Indian residential school as the subject matter of the TRC. Uh, we see the, the boundary in Schedule F, because through Schedule F of the, of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, there is a process by which one can um, present an institution as a federally funded Indian Residential School and include it in the TRC process. And last I looked, there were uh, about 1,500 institutions that were unsuccessfully <coughs> claimed as Indian Residential Schools. By far the majority of these were Indian day schools. 
Um, two schools were included, and I see that I already have five minutes left, which is shocking. So I'm trying to go through and give you some images. The audience, at the, the audience members at the Commissioner's Sharing Panel in Saskatoon in 2012 show the emotional impact of, of, the, of the TRC process, of listening to statements that people are giving to the Commission. Now I offer this picture to show you that it isn't always a packed room, that in the third day of the Commissioner's Sharing Panel we can see a certain fatigue setting in. And yet this was part of the TRC as well. Audience members in Ikawa's community hearings also show the emotion of listening to testimony. And John Mugalek at the TRC community hearings in Ikawa um, comes to the microphone, as did many of the people giving statements, with a helper, somebody who's there to provide emotional support. The same could be seen, as many people did, some four or five thousand at a time during the hearings, um, during uh, the downstreaming of the TRC national events. This photograph, to me, <coughs> captures probably better than anything else the emotion of the event. We have a couple of volunteers who's carrying a bag that looks like it weighs about three kilos of tears-soaked uh, tissues from the opening of the TRC national event in Inuvik, which was a very emotional event. The TRC was not just involved in um, the statement gathering process, but it took an active part in making the harms of the schools known to as wide an audience as possible. So because of its mandate, because of its outcome of litigation. Um, there was a situation that the TRC recognized at the outset that many Canadians had not heard about the schools. And in fact, a survey revealed that about half of Canadians had heard about the, the schools and about eight out of 10 Aboriginal people themselves has, had heard of the schools. So there was a gap in knowledge. So more than many TRCs, there was a promotion of knowledge. And this, this will continue through the establishment of the National Research Center on Indian Residential Schools. As part of my research, and this is my last slide, I've just whipped through them as fast as I can. <coughs> Five more minutes? Five more minutes? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> as part of the research, I wasn't just looking at the events, and I wasn't just talking to people who gave their statements. But I looked at people who didn't take part in the Commission's events. Some of those were survivors who didn't think their story really resonated enough, that they hadn't experienced enough harm. Others were um, priests, brothers and nuns in the Old Lake Order that I interviewed in a variety of, in a number of their residences. Um, Wilton Littlechild, one of the commissioners, also talked to priest brothers and nuns in the uh, residence in Albertville, north of Edmonton. And what I found from talking to them is that they didn't want to participate in a commission that was oriented towards survivor statements from the survivors of the schools for a number of reasons. One was the <coughs> settlement process that made them disaffected with the whole the whole sort of mechanism of statement taking, statement gathering. Um, and they saw the process as being inconsistent with their memories of the schools. I noticed that there was a kind of a contestation. Very rarely did, did priests, brothers, and nuns who weren't there to apologize, who weren't part of the clergy who was giving apologies or statements of regret or reconciliation to the commission. Rarely, very rarely did they appear. One of the ways that they brought their views across was silently through their photographic exhibits. And I noticed this in the Anglican church display at the Atlantic <coughs> National Event in Halifax in particular. We have things that represent their narrative of events. 
a contested narrative. The picture in the middle, which shows three young women with loaves of bread, and if you look closely, you can't see it, but they're actually wearing ice skates and standing on a frozen lake. All of these things evoke positive memories of the school, and so this seemed to me extremely puzzling. There seemed to be something that wasn't being said. And what this brought out to me in looking at the TRC and the boundaries, the borderlines, the, the crossings over, the templates and exclusions of the TRC, is that there was part of it that wasn't there. A most significant part, in my view, was the federal government that wasn't there when you begin to look. They were there at some of the opening events. The federal government was, in, in a court case, Blackwater v. Clint, um, considered to be 75% responsible for <coughs> the schools, and yet their participation was negligible. Some people have said that we get this story from the archives. We have the documents. We have to fight the federal government, the TRC did, to get those documents. But that's enough to tell the story. Why should we have heard from government officials? And yet, I think that there might have been something interesting to hear. There might have been something that relates more along the lines of Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil. And that is the way the schools operated and created an image or an idea of normalcy, of routine, of things that didn't stand out at all. The way that the abuses were concealed, yes, but also how the institutions themselves were taken for granted in Canadian society. And according to Hannah Arendt, you can't meet the demands of preventing the future harm of acts, the crimes of the state, unless you understand the perpetrators, unless you have ways of bringing out the banality of the way that the institutions were created and operated. When we're asked about the challenges of the TRC for the university, this is one of the things that I would focus on. It's to go, it's to recognize the TRC as a first step. To recognize the structure of truth commissions as inherently incomplete. If you had subpoena powers in a truth commission, then other aspects of it are left out. The only way to get a complete, more complete picture of these institutions and how they go wrong is up to universities, it's up to researchers, it's up to the critical examination over the long term of these kinds of institutions, of institutions more generally, of the 1,400 institutions that survivors of those institutions recognized as having something to do with Indian residential schools, as being sources of similar harm. So the challenge to the university is the incompleteness of the TRC and the next steps that need to be taken. Thank you very much. Thank you, and sorry for the misunderstanding on the time. <laughs> Marie.
challenges facing the university. So the remarks will be mostly focused on that. I do want to uh, begin, if I may, just uh, with a small clarification. And I want to thank uh, Professor Neeson for his remarks, because I think they underscore to what extent the work we have done and it's been my tremendous honor to be one of the three commissioners, but the work we have done has been a uh, feeling our way along project. There's no question about it. It's a TRC which in and of itself had a very particular mandate, unique in the world in many ways, some of the ways that, that Professor Neeson has mentioned and other ways that I could mention as well. But therefore, there's no roadmap for how do you do this? How do you go about it? And because, as well, it was fundamentally crafted and fought for uh, in, with, in the face of opposition by many of the major churches and the federal government, uh, that it really was a process in the minds of the survivors themselves. And so trying to stay to the spirit of what they might have been hoping for, trying to interpret the words on the page of our mandate, which were uh, the least legalese words in the entire settlement agreement, uh, was an ongoing feeling our way uh, process and we tried to keep ourselves on track by staying engaged with survivors throughout and by calling on the parties to the settlement agreement and I'm very happy to see today among other people, I see Brian McCullough here and perhaps others from the church and faith communities who were part of our major planning committees for those national events that were referenced and uh, it made all the difference in our ability to feel that we were um, um, responding to our mandate and trying to include everyone in this uh, work of reconciliation. I, I also want to speak to two quick little uh, points because they're, uh, they're small points but they're real issues. Uh, and one is I heard Professor Neeson refer to the common experience being with this, the money that was given to people whether they experienced, uh, whether they experienced harm or not. That money was given to people who went to the schools in recognition that there were harms experienced um, of a generic nature of the removal from family and language and culture and home and everything familiar. And that in itself was recognized as a generalized harm. The independence assessment uh, process was for additional and further and certainly more severe harms of a physical, sexual, and or psychological nature. The other harm that was not named in this avatar conversation today was spiritual harms. And those were also huge and significant and went to the very heart of people's own sense of identity, their own sense of perfection, and their own sense of being perfect in the eyes of creation as much as any other person. Uh, so I just wanted to touch on that. And the um, last thing I want to say is uh, it was in fact my great honor to be part of hearings that were held at the St. Albert residence uh, for the uh, old late fathers and a uh, number of sisters there as well. And we have two days of hearings specifically with the religious members of those communities. And so uh, we, we all have the experience of the commission that we had. Um, and we have, I completely agree, much work ahead to fill in the gaps of our own understandings, our own knowledge of what happened, but certainly the huge amount of work that remains yet to be done. So where does the academy fit into all that? And I think the academy starting place is the same place as every other sector of Canadian society, which is with um, honest truth telling to itself, to acknowledge the role that the academy played in the perpetuated ignorance Canada has had of itself, the things that we did not teach uh, the things that we did not acknowledge as being part of our history, the things that allowed us all to grow up to become adults, most of us, before we even realized that any of this had happened. So that's uh, being truthful about the beginnings of our own learned institutions and then saying, that can't be right going forward. What do we do with that? How do we begin to change that? And how do we begin to uh, revise and reform. And there's a reason why we addressed our 94 calls to action to various sectors of the society, including academia, because we count on in our society uh, places of higher learning as places that will groom the leaders of our country and the leaders of our society, the leaders of our businesses. And uh, we need for uh, all of these leaders in various fields to be well-grounded 
in our notions of uh, country, in our notions of relationship with each other, and in uh, truthful understanding of our, of our national history. I want to be specific in some things I might suggest just for your contemplation. The first is, and I'm kind of a broken record on this, so forgive me, but I would make a required reading, really simple to do, required reading on every single course in this university to read the 94 Calls to Action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. That's about an 8 to 10 page reading assignment. And if every student in this university could graduate from this university with at least one and if not multiple exposures to those calls to action, that would help them get their heads wrapped around it because they're not going to get caught. They're not going to get the benefit of the really tremendous work that's being done on curriculum reform now in many of our public schools um, beyond that. So that would be a way to do that. It would also um, imply necessarily that all the professors would do the same. I would say that universities, not this one in particular, but all, should pay attention to their admissions criteria and their admissions and outreach strategies and um, strategic efforts. <laughs> because the rooms I've been in on this university campus over the last four uh, months uh, have uh, not been representative of the uh, kind of renewed relationships we need to be nurturing and building um, in our society. I think that all universities, and this one I know because I read it recently in one of your own publications, has in fact lost ground on the front of indigenous faculty. So that needs to be a strategic and concerted effort. And having been in a position of hiring people over many years, uh, I want to offer a specific piece of advice which I actually gave in this very room a few weeks ago, but I'll repeat it. And for those of you who may have been here, forgive me for the repetition, but that is, we need to get outside ourselves in terms of our um, kind of notion of what is a real qualification. If we learned anything from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, it was that lived experience has value. Lived experience can teach a country. Lived experience can change minds and change understandings. And lived experience has value that we need to struggle to find ways to accredit <coughs> so that it can be considered. And I know it's possible because I can tell you of specific examples in this country where the co-creation of acknowledged and credited courses are being done by um, academically trained experts in cooperation with and direct collaboration with traditional knowledge keepers. Uh, and I'm talking very specifically about the case of residential school survivors, who are the experts of what they lived through. And so I think we can find ways, and what I used to do at CBC is I took that little phrase, I'm not saying we should be run, running roughshod over hiring, but I took that little phrase that said, other related experience, and I interpreted that as liberally and as creatively as I could and I tried to find the related experiences and the value of them. In terms of services on campus, this one and any others, um, you know, I'm a mother of three children, and my eldest daughter, I would say, is actually a gifted child, has always been noted in the school system as a, as a gifted child. But she was a failed university student, because where we live in the Northwest Territories, there isn't a university within a thousand miles at the nearest, and where she was was farther away, and there were no supports for her. There was nothing familiar about food, there was a lot of judgment about the kind of care packages we would send her, and she felt isolated and alone and um, culturally ridiculed. These things happened to a greater or lesser degree, and that was a long time ago. This is not a really old daughter of mine. So we need to think about what we have in place in the academic family setting uh, to provide community and to make it feel uh, welcoming and respected. And I'm not saying none of that is happening here. I think that's a question to ask oneself as an academic institution. Are we doing enough? Could we do more? And to that I would say, and by the way, ask the Indigenous students because they would certainly know whether there are things that are good enough, things that are missing, things that are fantastic that should be further nurtured. 
and things that would really make a huge positive difference. Um, I would say um, that um, to, to come back to the calls to action of the TRC, that uh, one of the things we referenced many times there throughout, uh, but since we're in the root court of the law faculty, the issue of acknowledging Indigenous law and even creation of fields of study uh, for uh, Indigenous law. And this university knows how to run programs with dual law programs and to recognize those and to integrate those both in the teaching and the application of them in practice. And I think we can do it with the third order. This university could be uh, the exemplary place for that to happen. The final thing I would like to say, and it's really to end where Professor Neeson ended in such an important and good way, the, all the work of the TRC, all the materials that we gathered and brought together, the oral history that we created of survivor statements, all of the archival material that we gathered from the government and the churches, all of that is housed now in the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is in, in a way kind of anchored in, at the University of Manitoba, but with partner institutions across the country. And that's uh, not a finite list of partners. It's an open-ended list. I'm not sure where this university is in its association with that, but it needs to be actively associated so that all those resources can be shared through the portals that are now so essential for information sharing. And there is a treasure trove there for ongoing research uh, that needs to happen, that we count on all the young academics to plow into, and that we count on all the senior academics to shepherd and to mentor in a positive way for our society's good. So thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak.
When I think of the challenges facing the university with respect to the TRC, we have to look at the status quo. And for me, it's a simple question. It's about how are things for Aboriginal people or Aboriginal staff, <coughs> Aboriginal students at the, at, the, at the school. That's how I look at things. And, what, and what, from what I can see, things are moving ahead. Things are progressing. And I'm particularly encouraged by our new provost, Christopher Van Freddy, under whose leadership I'm convinced will continue to uh, improve things for us. So let's begin, let's begin by give, giving credit where credit is due. Uh, for the past uh, at least nine years anyway, there's been programs like Indigenous Access McGill uh, here at the, at the school. Um, we have, of course, First People's House. We have the new Indigenous People's Minor. Okay. Social Work has recently approved a new required course on Indigenous issues, which is going to be rolling out to September. Met students now attend eight required lectures on Indigenous people, given by a Mohawk physician, Dr. Kent Saylor. That's new. So if they want their medical degrees, they have to you know, pay attention to those, those lectures. That's really important. But for me, uh, that's all good. And I'm sure there's many other good things going on that, at the school that uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> but for me, it's about what's missing. And, and being able to see signs or symbols that can connect indigenous people to the promise of education at this institution. Okay. And, it's not, and I'm not simply uh, talking about a fight for recognition, uh, but this is an honest effort that I'm trying to make to change affect levels, feeling levels, okay, at the university. About the, uh, the university uh, life, and attitudes towards Aboriginal people. For example, when walking uh, up to the Roddick Gates on, on Sherbrooke, we pass up there, okay, and we see on the right the, the James McGill statue. We see, we go a little bit further, we see the Quebec and, and the Canada flags and the flagpoles. To the left, we see the, the three bears there. <laughs> we see the classic uh, Greek columns at the Arts Building. And of course, on top, you see the market flying proudly. Okay. That's it. Okay. That's what we see. For me, as an Aboriginal person, I mean, it doesn't tell me too much. It doesn't, it doesn't affect me that, that strongly. Okay. We, yes, we have the Hushalaga Rock, but the problem with it is that nobody knows anything about it. Everybody I ask about that base, it's, it's been staring at everybody for since 1925, right by the Rod Gates. But nobody knows about it. So this is what I'm going to try to do with this point. It's impossible to see uh, by the right of gate. So we're going to be talking a little bit today about symbols and why symbols matter. Okay. <clears throat> there was I came across a great article uh, a few weeks ago uh, by the former president of the American Anthropological Society, who was a Chinese uh, American. His name is Francis. I don't know how to say it, H-S-U. And he talked about symbols and how symbols, looking at that symbol up there, look, looking at that, having the Shawnee flag, okay, what it does to you, how does it affect your, your inside, your feelings, your affect level. And uh, he says that these symbols are, are definitely, there is a connection between the two. And he wrote that Westerners often express feelings the same as everybody else, not Westerners. But he contends that the difference is what makes the Westerners feel and how. Th those two points are different. So I'll explain how, how so. While McGill was being built, for example, the workers found pottery shards, effigy pipes, and all kinds of little things uh, that were discovered, okay, uh, speaking uh, from the um, uh, St. Lawrence Arapayan people that were here, the original Hashalegans. And he, and he points out that while well, objects like this, okay, draw interest, okay, from Western specialists for a while, in the end they find no privileged places except in specialized libraries or museums. Like they are all the things that Dr. Uh, uh, Dawson found can be located to this very day right in the Macquarie Museum, okay. 
That's nice, but that's part of the problem. Okay. The difference is that when symbols are popularized, okay, and others end up in dusty museum drawers, that's a problem. Uh, Dr. Hassoub goes on to say that differences in patterns of affect or feeling is where people with unlikely cultural heritages fail to develop. And drawing on this, for things to develop further at McGill, <clears throat> we need to consider this important message from Dr. Sue. And it makes perfect sense. You know, if you don't see any symbols, it is extremely difficult to feel anything about it. Okay. And this is the basis of my talk today. <clears throat> so how can we do something about this? Very practical thing I'm talking about there. For example, we can increase affect here at the university each June 21st, which is National Aboriginal Day. And we can do it quite simply and quite quickly, okay, by hoisting that flag, the Hiawatha flag, okay, that, that, that symbolizes the Haudenosaunee people, okay, on top of the arts building to, for one day to take the place of the marlet that's up there and fly that flag for one day in respect. That's one way. Then the key, and we can also consider moving the Hashalak rock, which nobody knows about, but it's actually right under our noses, right by the gate. Okay? We can move it right across the street from the James McGill statue, for example, or right near the James McGill statue. Okay? Then people can learn about the Hashalak rock, okay? and that it commemorates <coughs> more than just a place where Cartier and the St. Lawrence with Iroquoians or the where the Hashalagans met in 1534. It's so much more than that. If, 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 if. And this would give people a chance to begin to dig and to try to find out about it. Because it actually, in, in a, it, for a, an Aboriginal's point of view, commemorates a caring relationship. That's what it does. Because we have to remember that these Iroquois people are the ones who actually uh, cured Cartier's men from scurvy. They were, they were very sick. They gave them medicine. They gave them food. They got them through that first deadly winter in 1534. Okay, that's the bigger story about this, and that's positive and that's good. Sure, things went south later on. Okay, but we started off okay in a positive way, and that's what I want to remember, and that's what the Hashalaga Rock can begin, you know, speaking for, and it can speak for everybody every day. Okay, this knowledge has the power to change. This knowledge about this rock, this simple rock that's been there since 1925, has the power to change the way people feel. Okay, if we get it out of the darkness where it's at right now and put it where it should be, next to the James McGill or right across the street. <coughs> and bringing this rock, removing this rock, can ignite that conversation. <coughs> For your information, this rock again, this Hashalaga rock, was placed in its current location in the 1920s. In another era, the horse and buggy days, okay, uh, when people had time to stop and read, okay. Uh, what publication of this rock was initially a good idea back then, it just doesn't cut it anymore. And we have to recognize that. And it's time to move that rock and, and do something with it because the site has become uh, neglected. People don't know about it. Discover McGill doesn't even bring anybody there. You know, when their first the students are first coming here to, to say, look at the rock, and this is the significance. Nobody even knows anything about it. I find that that really bothers me. That has to change. <laughs> Moving that rock into the light of day near the James McGill statue can be a significant and symbolic move for us all. I think of all the people who can who can see it. Okay, at graduation in May. Okay. All the thousands of people on the Remembrance Day, the people come here. How many people can see that? Okay. On Indigenous People Day, of course, the McGill Powell, and so forth, so on. Af the affect levels can change. You can begin changing the feeling, and that's what we have to do in this country. We can't. It, it's nice to, to 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 talk, you know, about uh, big ideas and, and this and that, the other. But we've got to do practical things to get the ball rolling here. You want to get the ball rolling here at this university, my university, which I'm part of. This is my idea about how we're going to do it. It's a, it yes, it is a simple idea, but we've got to start somewhere. Some, we've got to have some action. And this is what I'm proposing.
And we would do well to consider moving that rock. So it's not to forget the kind and considerate actions of these generous Iroquois back in 1534, who hosted Cartier, who healed these men, who took care of them, fed them, got them through their first winter. That's important. We've got to remember that. That's positive. There isn't much positive these days. But let's, let's, let's grab onto that and do something with it. Yeah. <clears throat> and consider these actions of these generous Iroquois, lest we weaken our own legacy as Canadians. Because that, news, that kind of news has to come out. Even our beloved market, okay, which is, flies on top of the arts building, okay, calls us to action. Okay? And you may wonder why. It's a symbol. A lot of people don't know what that symbol is about, though. Okay? That symbol, if you look carefully, read up on it, you'll notice that this part, the martlet doesn't have any feet. Hmm? And that's for a reason. It's believed that this inability to land symbolizes the unending quest to seek knowledge <coughs> and learning. Okay? That's why that bird never lands. And that martlet reminds us that of our duty to continuously broaden the understanding of knowledge, including the ind indigenous people history at McGill. And let's take that, let's take that to heart. Moving the Hashalak out the rock and hoisting the Hashalak, the Hiawatha flag, which is right here, will send an important signal okay, to all indigenous people. And it will change the level of affect for all Canadians. Some good, some bad, but hopefully all mostly good. Okay? It will change the level of affect. The ideas I have shared are simple, they're direct, they're cost effective. These, these ideas are doable. We can do this. We can do this within a year. Get it done. Okay, all we need is the will, and that's what we're talking about. There's no magic here. It just takes the will. It takes our will. We gotta want to do this. Okay, in my mind, this is a challenge for my university. Okay, so let's do this. In closing, here's to a renewed relationship and another salute to show our collective gratitude. Okay, as fellow human beings, as Mabillians, as Hachalagans, Montrealers, for having this precious second chance right now, okay, to get our relationship right again, okay, like we did during, the, during that winter of 1534. Let's never forget the promise of the McGill market to fly in the end of search for knowledge, all knowledge, no. Thank you. First Nations, the Inuit, um, or even the Dominion, we can mention, we begin to 
ask them, you ask the question, why are your languages so important? Why can't you, if a French, if somebody who is French, somebody who is English, somebody who is Italian can explain their philosophy in each of their own language, but it's the same Western philosophy, why are your languages so important? But when you ask that question and get into the discussion, you begin to realize you're entering into a different world that you don't understand. And I believe that the amount of work, if there was more work being done in that area, it would be a, it would be a huge, a, a huge benefit. For those, those of you who are involved, and I'm sure most of you are in one way or another, in the environmental movement, uh, will, will understand uh, that in fact the average of the indigenous worldview, both in terms of not just the tide of the land, but the tide of the ocean, which is going to become far more important, it's the area that I spent most of my time on, is going to be very he heavily indebted to the aboriginal, the indigenous worldview. And I think that, that, that much more work has got to be done in that area than is currently being done. And I can't think of any other place that it's going to be done except with indigenous scholars in our great universities. Now, having said that, um, if you were to say to me, OK, well, then what are the next series of issues um, that the universities uh, must address. My view is they've got to not address the issues that exist within the universities, but they've got to address the issues that prevent so many young people from getting to those universities. The fact of the matter is that, that if that you know the uh, an apology for um, the residential schools, uh, which was not followed up by any help for our primary and secondary <coughs> schools, no help for our uh, for the health care system, no help uh, for the child welfare system, uh, end, to end up ends up quite, quite clearly simply being an empty apology. And the fact of the matter is that if, when you take a look at the high school graduation rates being so much lower, you take a look, not that, but they don't do the studies on primary school of the lack of graduation rates, which are incredibly lousy. The fact is that you begin to understand that the problem that exists within our society, and the problem that exists in fact through the Reconciliation Commission, <coughs> is going to succeed. Uh, clearly, have, the universities have a role, but so much of that role has to do with putting pressure on making sure that what happens when those kids are born and then what ages, ages zero to six, and then four or older, but certainly before the before the university level. Um, this is probably this is the area where that I spend spend most of my time. And my basic the basic point that I would really raise with you is the question, which is the question that is dealt with those who are dealing with those three issues: who's, who's going to control education, primary and secondary school education? Who's basically going to control the way that healthcare delivery is done? This, in this case, for the First Nations on Reserve, very very strongly as well for England. Um, and how are we going to solve the welfare problem uh, where, you know, that the massive number of children who are in care are in fact indigenous children. Um, and, and, and while the 60s school is, is, uh, is now dated by the call, by calling it the 60s school, the same problems of kids being taken away from their communities, going into, going into uh, offshore, or not, sorry, sorry, off reserve communities, Losing their ability to have their culture, not having parents, not having an education, is probably the greatest single tragedy and the greatest single black mark that this country has faced. And I, I must say that I would like to spend a lot of time discussing the Aboriginal worldview, the Indigenous worldview here. Um, I would soon run out of my capacity to do it, but I'd probably rather sit down and listen to somebody who may be able to do it. But this is something I know a little bit about. And I guess what I would really say is the following, and I will not go over time, I'm going to close. The fact of the matter is that the Kelowna Accord, which you mentioned, which you mentioned when you talked about this, was an attempt to deal with the major issues. We spoke, we sat down with the indigenous leadership, we said, what are your problems? And what are the ones we have to deal with if in fact we're going to deal with the, you know, the, the, the problems for which the ultimate apology is going to be made? And they, they addressed them. They said very clearly it's health care, it's education, it's child welfare, it's housing, it's clean water, it's economic development. And we said, fine. Those are the issues. We're not going to impose them. We'll deal with your issues. Now let's see if we can find the solutions. And they spent 18 months working on the solutions. They're very much involved in the provinces and very much obviously involved in all three of, of, uh, of 
the, of the country's indigenous peoples. And then, of course, what happened was the apology was made that the monies that were set aside for health care, education, and welfare were just for school. My, it is my, my <coughs> belief that this debate, not over how much money are we going to put into it, but who is going to control it, is going to be the major debate in the country. The fact of the matter is, the First Nations, and they said, and this is really broke down in the, the government, the First Nations said, you use those primarily as the example here, we must control it. The inherent right of self-government says we must control our education, we must control our health care, we must control our welfare. And the fact of the matter is, these are our children, we understand our children, we must be able to control them. Now, that debate in the country has been won. The fact is, the new government has come in, the new government has said two things. It has said, yes, you should control your health care, you should control your education, you should control uh, um, your welfare. Now, where do we go from here? And it is now up to the indigenous people to say how they want to control it. And this is where the challenge lies. And if you were to ask me what is the single biggest worry I have, is that the First Nations have not said how they want to control their education. They have not said how they want to control health care. And they have not said how they are going to control welfare. And my worry is that if we don't deal with that issue within the, life first, within the first term of this government, and we are going to lose a phenomenal opportunity to do it. They put the money on the table. They have said, we will accept that you must control this. But you've got to tell us how you're going to do it. Because all I can really say to you is what I would imagine. I would just simply ask you that if, if, many, if, great, if millions of dollars are spent in these areas, and five and six years from now we have not shown progress, then we are going to find ourselves in exactly the same situation we've done before. And so my request, is that now we're here talking about the universities, that I think if a real, where the real work has to be done is to answer the question. There's no doubt in my mind that are, in terms of indigenous educators in this country, there are people who would put any, uh, most people to, to, to shame. There are tremendous uh, uh, indigenous educators in this land. The Royal, Co the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons has put together a project with a young Aboriginal doctor who basically wants to take a look, working with the Royal, the Royal College as to how in fact they can take care of their health care within their own area. Welfare is now open to be brought back within the communities. But I can tell you that the First Nations, the Métis, and the, and the, the Inuit are going to have to step forward and take, take control of this. And if they do that in a way that's going to satisfy us, that the money is going to go, but primarily satisfy their own, their, their own communities, then we will change this country. And if we don't, then we are going to miss the biggest opportunity that we have ever had to do the right thing. Thank you. and multi-dimensional the problem is, which reminds us is that, that there's no quick fix. Uh, a TRC, no matter how good or how close to perfect it might be, is never going to be enough, and a lot of what's going to come out of that is really going to be determined in the future, not today. <coughs> the other thing that, that I think is important is that in addition to teaching people, what universities do is they provide a platform for discussion. And who else but a university could have convened a panel as diverse and interesting as this one? But I think it's the kind of public debates and discussions that we need to hear more of. Uh, now it's up open to, to the floor. So uh, we'll, I think we'll take three questions. You can direct it to the panel as a whole or particular people on the panel. And after three questions, we'll let the panelists answer, and then we'll go for another round. Um, so we, on the south of Montreal, you have uh, the, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and one of the biggest um, we haven't really talked about economics. A lot of this has been about education, but a large part of Canada's effort to destroy indigenous people it seems, was to kind of just take resources or be able to build infrastructure like the, the steam, like the uh, railroad, like John McDonald. Um, the question I have is um, one of the big demands that the Mohawks make is that they should receive compensation for the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, Mr. Martin, I know you know a lot about the Seaway. Um, do you think that the Mungan Wage should receive compensation? 
And um, like, cause I mean, even if they got 1% of the pro annual profits, that's like tens of millions of dollars, but it's like uh, $10 billion goes through the same one Syria every year. Do you think that the indigenous people should receive compensation for their losses? Because they lost a lot of land, especially gone along in. So I'll take two more questions, huh? And so my question is from Mr. Michael Lott. Um, I think that it was uh, interesting that you brought up the importance of symbols. But I have a question, um, and it's, it's quite complicated, but uh, there's, a, there's a problem in terms of, uh, I think, that is sometimes perceived by minoritarian cultures, and it's in terms of cultural appropriation. And I understand your your way to say that uh, celebration of, uh, of symbols or of uh, minority cultures can be uh, you know, positive and have positive effects. But I wanted to hear you on um, how it can be perceived by the minority in terms of, uh, for example, uh, why the dominant, the dominant uh, part of the, like example, the white people of Canada or uh, Western society culturally appropriating a symbol of a minority culture um, I can give you an example. Uh, example in the there's a music festival in Montreal, Oshiaga. I think most, most of you know about it. And they banned uh, last summer the use of the of uh, certain uh, symbols like the Mohawk. Uh, there was Mohawk uh, hats that were sold before, and people were bringing it, and they, they banned it because they because some people of minority cultures saw that as uh, an insult or as not being properly celebrated. And I think this is important because there's the same kind of uh, discourse from, example, the uh, African the African American culture, where they say that dreadlocks, for example, worn by uh, white people is not <coughs> proper and it's actually insulting because their 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 hair did not dread naturally, so it's, it shouldn't be done. It's not accurate and it's it's random. So I want to hear you on how do you want how are we supposed to celebrate those symbols without looking like the dominant group seeking to, uh, you know, almost be hypocrite about uh, symbols that are important for, without appropriating it, uh, misappropriating it, probably, is a good question. One, one more question. Yes. One of the important calls, actually, in the, produced by the TRC was the restoration, the encouragement of Aboriginal languages, indigenous languages. And I'm just wondering, what did you hear, asking perhaps Dr. Wilson, what did you hear about the different strategies that were being proposed in different communities across the land regarding the reappropriation of indigenous lang language and understanding the importance of language for culture and indeed spirituality? What could be done concretely in a context like our own to encourage the learning of Sir, would you work this way? You can answer any or all of the questions you want. Well, I mean, I'll, 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 uh, I'll try to address two of them, the, the first and the third. Um, on the question of, uh, of, of compensation uh, for, for the sale of it can be demonstrated uh, that, in fact, the Mohawks lost land and for which there was no compensation. Well, you're saying, for God's sake, you can be. Okay. Um, if it can be demonstrated uh, that that is the case, then clearly, uh, then clearly the argument for compensation becomes, sorry. Uh, if it can be demonstrated, this is the third time I've said it, so God, I guess, right? Uh, uh, um, then, then obviously an argument can be made, can be made for, for, for compensation. One of the things that you will hear, of course, is, what is, who is, who is entitled to the compensation? If this is direct Mohawk land, they're the ones that lost it, this is what happened. St. Lawrence Seaway is a very big, is a very big uh, uh, waterway. Um, and so you're obviously going to have ramifications right throughout the whole waterway, and I think that's the kind of thing that we have to be examined. Within that same context, by the way, which is probably not the right answer to, not the way you'd like to answer the question, but it's been a long time to politics, I guess I know I'm not the answer one. Um, <laughs> but it, it is, is the question of who owns these resources. I think that one, one of the things that has not been made out of is the, con the constant argument that is made in terms of the ownership of resources, what happens to be right next to my community. But what has not been made is the fact that the ownership of the first peoples of, these, of this land right across the river, and how is that going to be dealt with? And I think that is something, if you want to know what the university should be dealing with, I think that's a much larger question. And, that, uh, and, and, and the reason that I really 
say this, is that, is that the, owners, the ownership of resources in the country or the resources in the country are not equally divided, and yet we've got people across the country. And I think that we've got to take a look, I think we've got to take, to take, take a look at this. I also want to, by the way, do believe very strongly that, that, that the issue of compensation uh, is one that has got to be uh, tied into um, this whole argument proper funding. And, and I think, I mean, I think that the single biggest problem is the inadequate funding. I don't, I think that governments are underestimated by a considerable amount, just what it's going to cost. And I think they've got to be prepared for that. And so I think that is, I think that's the nature of the discussion. I think it's a valid point that you raised. I also think it's a much wider discussion that's going to be that I On the question of languages, um, I, I, it's taken me a long time to understand um, the importance of, la of languages. I don't think that for those of us who are not, who, who are not indigenous, it's an easy thing to understand. I mean, language is, language is just simply a way I'm gonna convey the message that, that language is not uh, a, a nearly as integral uh, to our philosophy as it is for the, for the, as it is for the indigenous people. And it's taken me a long time to understand this. But where I really began to understand it was not so much in just in terms of the importance of language per se, um, but in terms of the, the, uh, what it means to identity and a young person's resilience, number one, what it means not just in terms of understanding culture, but in fact it was with the Mi'kmaq when we got talking about how do you teach math. And I suddenly realized that in Mi'kmaq math was totally dependent upon language and the way in which they looked at it. And their capacity to teach math uh, has been actually enhanced by the fact that they were using their own understanding of Mi'kmaq math within their language. Mi'kmaq don't say one, two, three, four. They say one thing, two things, three things. They have to identify it. They actually change the numbers. Uh, depend they don't have zero. They, do they don't have to change the numbers depending on what they're looking at. So, but, but the interesting thing is, is also the way that with the immersion courses, um, where, the, where, the, where the, the students learn the original language, whatever their language happens to be, how quickly, one by the time they get into the later grades, how quickly they're able to merge into English, and in fact, their English improves. And I just think that's a huge something, and the people should talk about it. Again, ignite discussion into who are these people that, that, that 
you know, lived here before McGill was here. You know, what are they about? What's the bigger story? Uh, the story of Cartier and the way things were good at the beginning. Things eventually went south, but you know, that's what I mean by that. You know? and, and I just want to keep it at that level. I don't want to broaden it into any other kind of uh, way and lose focus you know, on what I'm trying to, to say or uh, talk about here today. Okay? Thank you for the question. I think it's a, a very important question, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Martin for raising the issue of language in the first place with his remarks. And uh, I realized it was an omission, and one of the things I had wanted to identify myself because I think that is an area where uh, universities, um, in their founding forms, most universities, which have more often than not started as arts facilities. Uh, language is one of the things that they are expert in and are specialized in. Linguistics associated with that, comparative linguistics, and, and many people who are experts in language construction who are not necessarily literate or speakers of the language, but who understand and study how languages fit together and in a comparative way how they compare and contrast. So I think that's an area that is really Important. My understanding of this university is that you can study Swahili, but you cannot study Mohawk. That's my understanding of the university here. So, you know, it's just a question to, to ask oneself, and, and I'm not the expert on that, so I hope I'm not misspeaking, but it was a, a conversation that I had recently with some of my students on that very, that very issue. I, I want to answer your question with a couple of examples, but I also would like to speak to the issue of language as we came to understand it more deeply through the work of the Commission. And um, so in terms of examples, a couple, and, and I'm not a companion of examples on language, but I know that we saw a very, very um, beautiful example in a college where a um, preschool and daycare facility was um, provided in Inuktitut only, but it was not limited to any children. It was open to all children. There was a waiting list. And uh, the children had regular encounters with the elders at the senior center and went to visit them and perform dances and sang songs for them. Um, and uh, you could go there as a parent and stand by if you were a non-speaker and learn by absorption, but you had to allow for the language spoken in the daycare facility to be spoken. In. Part of that. And uh, so that was very uplifting for me to see. It was also incredibly touching to see the little ones with the elders and the response and the relationship that that um, created there for them. Um, we saw a wonderful example. Uh, it, it was indeed in the Mi'kmaq community, but it was in the context of commemoration. And uh, it was a uh, survivor community there of who had all been involved in the Shubanaki Residential School, and they chose to have a commemoration project that would be grounded in language reclamation. And they worked with students at the high school level, those ones, and they did uh, the work of uh, building and creating drums, uh, learning songs, uh, learning to uh, introduce themselves, and the work of designing a commemorative um, um, like a monument that was uh, bilingual, uh, Mi'kmaq and English. And the students were the ones who led the ceremony when it was time for the unveiling of the commemoration. They uh, played their drums for the first time, sang their songs, but it was the whole process of preparing for that moment and language was embedded into that preparation work and these children were able to take lead part in that commemoration activity on um, the Mi'kmaq language. And the third one that I would mention, and I know it more kind of on a headline basis, but I know that uh, in Baldor, in fact, where we recently heard of more dire things going on, but there's a, a wonderful facility there um, at the Friendship Center that includes um, engagement, and I think, it, I think it also has a, an after-school care, but also a child care element there, and my understanding <coughs> at the time we were there, and this was now a few years ago, was that there was also a waiting list from the, shall I say, mainstream community wanted to be part of that. There were elders who were a regular part of the activity there in the center, and language was a core part of that as well. So that's some examples. What I wanted to quickly say, if I may, Dr. Armstrong, is just 
One of the things that struck me and touched me is that for many people who spoke to us during the commission, by their own acknowledgement, could not speak their indigenous language, but they knew how to introduce themselves in their language. And they knew how to say their spirit name. And what struck me is that the words that they have are essentially sacred words of prayer. And isn't that a powerful starting point for reclamation of language? And isn't that a treasure thing to hang on to as the last thing you lose for those who have only that left? Um, that it also speaks to the point that was being made by Mr. Martin again, though, and that is what language reveals. And those words, uh, that you even have a spirit name, and that you say that in Indigenous language, says something about a worldview that talks about the spirit within you that is part of you and for which you carry a special name. Um, the fact that um, so many people spoke to us about their failed attempts at healing from multiple forms of addiction, and the one thing that finally worked for them was being reintroduced slowly but surely to their culture, and that had hugely to do as well with language and being able to uh, feel that they had an identity, that they were beginning to understand what that was, and that they were part of something that was um, just as worthy and noble as any other identity that had been superimposed. And um, the um, last thing that I wanted to say is the issue of language and indeed identity as it relates to land and the environment. And I'm not a fluent Dennis speaker, but I know a lot of words in Dene. And one of the things that's revealed for me, for example, is how everyday things that we take for granted are actually described in relationship to nature, such as what time is it? It's all about your relationship with the sun. And that's how you say it. When you count, it's the relationship of the numbers to each other. So six isn't six. Six is two times three. The math is embedded in the counting. And um, it's, it reveals a worldview which is all about relationship and not isolation and uh, siloing of individuals and of things. Uh, sweet, more questions? Yeah. I just want to say a couple of words in support of the idea of, of uh, founding language studies uh, to support uh, Indigenous peoples at the Guild. But I, I speak as somebody who is very responsible for creating the Swahili uh, course <laughs> 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 at the Guild. And thank goodness, Swahili is so important for the whole eastern half of, uh, of Africa. It, it, in fact, it is probably the only uh, indigenous African language that has that sort of, of, of spread. And the interest began because people were coming back and forth on field study programs and internship programs, and they were really passionate about it, and they continue to be. There's always more demand that can be filled by, by the, the one course that exists. But rather than saying, if they can do have Swahili, turn it around and say, if Swahili has that importance, surely we should also build <coughs> and, and, and focus on the central importance of pre or Mohawk, or Mi'kmaq, and uh, I, I, I think having a course or two being taught within the Indigenous Studies minor would be a wonderful, uh, wonderful initiative. And you can spoke, uh, point to Swahili as a positive example. Of course, we have also, what, Chinese, and uh, uh, Japanese, and Korean, and uh, so many other languages being taught at, at McGill. But having these Indigenous uh, cultures represented uh, is, is, is crucial. So use Swahili as your positive example so that you can then say, surely we can have this, uh, you can see the importance of indigenous languages in Canada being taught in, uh, at, uh, in the Foundry of the Arts, I would think would be the place. We won't find it in the, in the linguistics department, <coughs> because they're doing Chomsky in linguistics, and there's no room for this sort of thing, but we can certainly find a place, a place I would think, in uh, indigenous studies. Well, I just want to apologize if in any way you've understood my point to be that 
Swahili is not either not worthy or shouldn't be here. That's not my point at all, but rather to point out the gap. And you've understood that, so I really agree completely with what you've said. Absolutely. And Aboriginal languages count towards the honors requirement and languages for international development studies. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, I guess this would be either way. The, what are the challenges in incorporating at a university in relation to the nation to nation uh, experience in the TRC and in addition to the nation to nation different requirements for funding rather than getting into sort of a native studies type thing where we're just pretending like they're all you were talking about a Diné experience, Martin would talk about a, a uh, Mohawk experience. The challenge is going forward in that regard so that it doesn't get bottled into sort of native studies. And I know it's kind of complex. And they, in the same way with funding, problems with certain communities have very different funding needs and very different institutional needs than others. <coughs> Two more questions, yeah, in the back. Yeah. Um, so this is on a bit of a more macro level than the, than the university question, but as someone who's interested in federalism specifically, I picked up on a specific part of Mr. Martin's talk when you mentioned that it's more of, some of this can be thought of moving forward as more of a federalism issue than it is necessarily a fiscal issue. Um, so I was wondering if maybe you as well as Dr. Wilson could speak a little bit to um, the role of the provinces moving forward in terms of progress. I know we hear a lot about um, what Indigenous groups can do and what the federal government can do, but I think there's sometimes a, a, a gap in information in terms of the role of the provinces. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. <coughs>
that residential school survivors experienced when they were taken away. Uh, I want to talk to the law schools of Canada that were not rigorous in their investigation of the settlement agreement when they allowed the TRC funding, which was a part of a legal settlement belonging to survivors, um, when they allowed, without comment, that that money, that those monies be held by the very party against which the lawsuit had been brought. Under which circumstance do you ever win a, 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 a case and the person who harmed you keeps the money and tells you how <coughs> you should uh, conduct your, your process? Uh, those are just a few things that I'm, I'm speaking, I've been given that language. So I just wanted to, um, to ask about this notion of rigor and for us to really take into account that, that this process, this very educational process, these centers can be and can create uh, spaces of assimilation that complete the whole rest of all the residential schools. Thank you. Okay, so so we'll, we'll, yeah, the panelists, will, the panelists will respond. We should have time for another three questions. So maybe if there's anything. Oh. If I can, uh, I'd like to address the last question, um, which I think speaks to the structural difficulties of establishing the TRC in a way that meets the requirements of truth uh, of, uh, and of reconciliation. One of the, and thank you for your question, which actually had a lot of interesting factual detail in it. I think looking at the TRC as it did its work, there was an effort to accommodate some of the diversity of the um, survivor participants and people who were attending. I was impressed with the number of languages that were actually being um, uh, simultaneously translated. I think the record was in uh, Iqaluit, wasn't it? There was a, in Nuvik, rather, yeah. There were like seven different indigenous languages that were being simultaneously translated. At the same time, the structure of a truth commission of this kind with a single category of survivor tends to flatten out the diversity of people participating. Um, it tends to flatten out the variety of experience in schools. It, it has that kind of structural effect, which is why I, I brought this into my discussion as part of a beginning. One of the things that the university can, can do is address that flattening out, address the variety of experiences, try to overcome that structural <coughs> limitation of this TRC, and in fact of any TRC that could have been conceived. The fact that the federal government was responsible for the funding, of course, is shocking. You may have noticed from one of my slides that the federal government, the party to the settlement agreement that's the, seen as being the source of harm, was also the party that was responsible for making decisions under Schedule F. Uh, and it took the, the um, Superior Court of Justice in Ontario to make those determinations ultimately. Um, I'll just make a quick comment on your multifaceted question and important questions. I wasn't in the rooms that you were in where the crafting of the TRC was happening. I inherited the TRC mandate that I got and we, we tried in our processes to have regular check-ins with the parties to the agreement who signed off on that mandate and to the um, survivors themselves from the organizations that were assigned to us. Uh, to uh, see whether we're on track or not, and we were very rigorous whenever we went out to any community events to have community-based uh, committees that worked with us and advised us. And I'm sure it was not perfect, um, but it was uh, definitely well-intentioned, and I think it was good in the ways that it was good and flawed in the ways that it, it surely was flawed. And it felt that way both, I'm sure, um, externally, but certainly internally for me as well a number of times. Um, but having said that, 
Um, I know the response we've received generally from survivors, and I know the response we've received generally from the party. So um, I think we um, we offered the best of what we could, um, given our own understandings of what we were tasked to do. I do think that um, the issue of provinces is an important question in our calls to action. We were actually specific in naming a number of things that belong with the provinces now, and partly because of the evolution of Canada from when the schools first started to now, there's been enormous, first of all, addition of several of the jurisdictions that didn't exist as standalone jurisdictions when the schools first began, but also the transfer of authorities and, and responsibility for some categories of health care and education itself, which was transferred in many ways. Um, so we did. Uh, specifically talk about a number of things uh, that sit with the provinces and the roles in which we think provinces have a role to play. But we were repetitive on this point. There's almost nothing in the calls to action that says any level of government should be doing things on their own. <coughs> they almost all say a variation of in collaboration with, in conjunction with, in partnership with, in communication with, in consultation with indigenous peoples, indigenous organizations, indigenous community leadership, whatever. And that's, it's the how of it, doing things together instead of separately, one deciding for the other that we really have to arrest. Um, and the other question of um, uh, the funding nation to nation, I confess I didn't fully understand your question, but I may also not be the one best equipped to, to answer it, so maybe I'll, I'm sorry, Mr. Martin, I'm gonna leave that with you. <laughs> It's more funding and education in that ensuring that the different needs of different nations as well as the different experiences of different nations across the country is more making sure that it's more promoted and more understood so that there's not this sort of blanket discussion of both the residential school system and <coughs> the needs of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, for example. Uh, Does that make sense? Specifically about residential schools? Yeah. About understanding experience and about understanding uh, the needs to ensure that they're. Well, you start with it. I, I, I guess I'll answer the questions and I'll ask the first order to deal with the funding one. Um, first of all, there has to be a, a very large increase in general funding right across the board, in terms of healthcare, in terms of welfare, uh, in terms of, of education. So we begin, we begin with that. Now, there are different, there are uh, different funding angles. Um, it is, it is, the tragedy is that these different funding angles are not based on need, but they are based on the capacity of the, of the, uh, of the community to get the money uh, and to demonstrate the need for it. As an example, you'll find that British Columbia has a higher percentage has a higher percentage of people who get higher funding because in fact they've got a very they've got a very good education set up with ask and the British Columbia School Board. So it almost becomes down you get more money if in fact you can prove your case and if you can show that you can if you can demonstrate it. And that's not on the basis of need, which is why for instance places like you know the the Mission Alaska Nation where the greatest need is this is Northern Ontario, although I mean in fact places like Washington and Saskatchewan are not getting the so uh, the answer is yes, it clearly the funding should be on the basis of need. Um, it's, going, it's going to be the federal government and the provinces are going to have to work together to basically make sure that that's the way it happens. But all, also means that those individual communities are going to have to demonstrate that they can, they can handle this and that they can run it. Which is harder when you're dealing with a poor community versus a richer community. <coughs> said, uh, this is, cannot be done without the provinces. That's all there is to it. Um, and, and, and the examples that I can, I can give you are, are for the sake of discussion. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, in terms of education, uh, there's probably, there are probably more kids, more students in public schools throughout the provinces than there are on reserve. But a lot of those kids, go, those students go back and forth. They go back to the reserve, they come back and forth, they go back and forth. 
and they lose every time they do it. So there has to be a, there has to be a reconciliation with the feds in the province as to how, what you're teaching. There has to be an understanding. <coughs> they do go back and forth. In fact, they don't, they don't, they don't lose everything. In terms of health care, um, I mean, a number of us think that the single biggest issue is being or not, but one of the most is trauma. And that the whole question of trauma, well, the, the federal government is not strong in trauma. Uh, and where there are trauma uh, 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 units, uh, they're all provincial and they may well be near a, but they may well be near a community. But if, if they're not available to the community, then it isn't going to work. And to say that we're going to have a trauma unit in every single reserve, I, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think it should, have, should be the case, but I think it's going to be so expensive that they're not going to do it. So there has to be the marriage between the provinces and the feds. You can't do this. You can't do this uh, uh, separately. It's the same thing with welfare. Welfare is going to be repatriated back onto the reserves. But the worst thing in the world you can do is repatriating back onto the reserves, and nobody, nobody with any expertise in welfare, is there to deal with it. And, and the fact is that most of the most of the expertise in this country is with, is with the provinces, because in fact what the feds did is that they delegated to the provinces and then compensated them for seventy five percent. They cut, they cut 25%, which is why welfare for average and Canadians have been so lousy. So the, the federalism question, the, the, two, the two levels of government, the three levels of government, we go out, orders of government, which is to say that in the case of the First Nations, the First Nation governments, the community governments, and then the province of the feds are going to have to come together. Now, your, your question, you, you said watch out talking about worldviews, because in fact, different nations have different worldviews. Um, I, I agree. Um, uh, first of all, I'm not going to take you on, on this directly because one of the things I've heard is don't take on some of you don't know what you do. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, there's no doubt there, that if you talk to when you talk to the law versus talking to the Cree versus talking to the Mi'kmaq or the Dakota or wherever you talk to, there are there are differences. Um, it was my impression that while there are differences, they are differences at the edges. They are not differences at the core. Now, if I'm wrong, um, then I, I would like to see that based, based on the discussions that I have had, and not just with, not just with indigenous people in Canada, uh, but in fact, indigenous people in other parts of the world, that there is a common core. Um, now, I don't know if any, <coughs> if any really solid academic work has been done on this. If it is, I'd love to read it uh, and, uh, and to see it. Um, I, I think it's a very, it would be a very, very interesting study to see. I can't believe that there isn't a common core, but I'm also prepared to see it since I, I don't know. It would be an interesting thing to see. Um, I don't know, Marie, this is not fair, but or do you, does anybody have a view? Well, the UN definition of indigenous people includes a cultural core relationship to the land. So there's plenty of differences, but it's there may there's certain pillars which at least the United Nations in the, the United Nations in defining indigeneity tried to recognize. And so there, there is a consensus, but it's not maybe as extensive as some people think or, or push it, but the, the cultural relationship to the land I think is a strong force which is consistent with what you said about the environment. But then you know people even in, on the panel there were different Examples of how people counted or didn't count the math. And that's a really huge difference that shows, it says a lot about diversity. And so it's, it's really finding the common elements without losing too much in the, in the, in the, in the meantime. Do you want to see So if you, for lack of time, maybe two questions. This, this woman here, I think, was waiting, and, and, and Dan, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Oh, oh and then, okay, it's one more, the third person. Is it, is it my turn? Is it my turn? Uh, no, I, I would just like to, um, to comment on the sociologist's um, 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 statement about the, the, the oblates and the, the religious orders, uh, you know, not being too cooperative. Um, has there been any attempt in this truth and reconciliation, and I, and I underline truth, about the, um, the contribution of the religious orders as well. Maybe not in the, uh, you know, in, in, in the time, that, in residential schools, 
in that very bad period. But for example, if you read the history of the Grey Nuns, they were asked to go out. They, 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 they had a very, very good relationship initially with going into the reserves and, and you know, helping them. And it was a, a very, very good relationship. And also, uh, the Jesuits, of course, uh, translated um, the, uh, a, a lot of their uh, writings into the um, indigenous languages. And I would just like to see a bit of a balance, a bit of, a, well, a, of an emphasis on truth, because one cannot have reconciliation if you feel that there is sort of um, a, a, a vendetta and a false vendetta. I mean, you know, there, yes, that uh, you are guilty for what you are guilty for, but to have it completely tainted black and white, personally, I find irritating. So that's my comment. Yeah. I, I was struck by the earlier reference to Arendt and the banality of evil in institutions. And, uh, I thought some of the other comments too sort of teased some of that out with uh, the sense that, you know, even at a university like McGill, uh, there's a, a large you know, aspects of some indigenous history and culture, the very land on which the university sits. I uh, comment that uh, uh, Mr. Martin had raised earlier about all, you know, the real needs in, in, in healthcare, education, social work, like the places where sort of the rubber hits the road in these communities where you need these resources, they need to be connected to the communities, they need to be delivered in a way that's connected to the communities. Well, the formation process for all of that takes place in universities. I mean, we're the folk that turn out <laughs> the social workers, uh, the educators. But you know, are there are do we have you know do we have the kind of collegial collaboration with these communities and capacity to really deliver? I don't think so. Um, and, and how do we how do we get there? I mean, how do we how do we develop those those you know that capacity to to you know to recruit and to form in a, in a way that would be meaningful. And I was wondering if Michael, given his work in social work, which is one major area, would have, based on his experience, any suggestions of how to take steps to move in that direction. And then the, the last question. <coughs> well, I just wanted to ask, to make some comments, actually. To Dr. Wilson, I wanted to say that I really appreciated that you actually were a commissioner with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think it's one of the most difficult things that was done. And when I look at the other two guys, when I look at Murray and I look at Willie, I think, my God, have they suffered. They've taken in all of this pain and suffering and ingested it. And I have to say that I'm amazed by the work that you've done. So congratulations. in a class for Maliseet language. I'm a Mohawk, by the way, of Ganawagan. I'm also one of the chiefs of the Mohawk Council of Ganawagan. But at that time, I took lessons in Maliseet language. That was in 1966. And so then, when I went off to University of Western Ontario, they had Inuktitut, and that's what I took. I took a course in Inuktitut. These are not things that are offered that easily now, you don't see it. Except you will see occasionally that universities will have lessons in Cree. The thing is, what can we learn about each other? The most difficult thing it is, there is, is to understand each other. 
you look at Europe and you see all of these countries, and you see Spain, then you see the Vascongada, the Basque people, completely different from the rest of the Spaniards. You see a different language, different cultures. You look at France, you see different language, different cultures, all of the different departments of France. You look at England and you see its background. Then you come to Canada and you don't see it. I don't believe how people have no real interest in learning about each other or differences. You think that if you just go to something and you're going to dance something or be included in, in a dance, that makes your day. That, it's amazing the depth of knowledge that people don't have. When you look at that, sim that flag back there, the Iowatha flag, you look at it and you see that those are the nations gathered together, the Haudenosaunee nations. There's five nations there. Of course, it became six after a certain period of time. And you look at that and you don't realize that it also is a symbol for governance. It's a symbol for a constitution. It's a symbol for a way of being. So how do you learn those things? You learn by reading. And this is what you do at university. That's what I did at university. That's how I learned about you. But I also learned Canadians are willing, Canadians have a kind of heart to really take on solving painful things. This is painful. And uh, it's an impressive thing to me that you take it on. But you can't skate lightly over it. So universities have to take on recommendations such as WISIT, Michael made just a moment ago, just on these little things. Little things. They make a difference. And about the St. Paul Seaway, I lived in the St. Lawrence River all summer long, every summer until I was 12, and all of a sudden, there was the seaway. And it caused trauma to me. And I lost language, river terms. And I never noticed I lost the river terms because now I didn't have access to the river. Until much later when I was working as a lawyer with, with Akwazasne, which is a Mohawk territory. And the men I was seated with were talking about the river. I didn't understand not one river term. They were talking about inlets, creeks, rapids, currents, and they were words that had just been lost. So I wanted to speak about the St. Lawrence Seaway in that we have had claims against them, and yes, you know that they have been settled. But really, what happened is a bigger trauma than what was compensated for. That little breach, that little cutting through of our territory really caused great trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, my <clears throat> some weight here, okay. Um, uh, for example, I, I talked about Christopher and Matt Freddy. I've been dealing with him when he was, in the, earlier on, when he was the Dean of Arts. And he used to come to our faculty meetings and, and I noticed the, the tone of voice that he had, the understanding, the sparkle in his eye. You know, he was listening, he was actually listening to us. So I took an interest in him because of the way he was, he was uh, presenting himself. 
And I made a decision, you know, down over the years to try to develop some kind of a relationship with him. For now, he is uh, a pro, a pro bono. Huh? And I want to continue doing that in the little bit of time that I have left here, because I'm, I'm leaving in May. But for me, it's, 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 it's about trying to reach out, the, uh, targeting people that want to listen, that want to move uh, the agenda forward. Okay. That's what it's about. And coming up with a, a committee, you know, a secretariat, you know, some kind of uh, formalized group that uh, McGill can take ownership for, work with the Aboriginal people to develop constructive projects here at the school. Okay. That's how I see <coughs> new things. Uh, I think that that's the only way, in my opinion, to, to, to try to move this forward. Okay. And as for the, the lady over here talking about balance, uh, what's your name? Um, me? Yeah. Maura McKellen. Okay. I was hearing you. I was hearing what you were saying. And uh, I hear you I hear you loud and clear. I mean, there has to be balance. I remember my father was in residential school himself, and he told me, and there was, he met good people in there. Not everybody was evil, and not everybody was wicked. Thank you. And all this kind of thing, you know. Uh, he wanted to emphasize that to me. But irrespective of, of that, you know, uh, I'm a social worker. I deal with people, you know. Uh, at, we are the court, social workers, the court of last appeal for many human beings okay, in Canada. And uh, I can tell you, you know, about the damage, you know, the system has done mm -hmm. and these experiences of these people. It's real. It still is. The, the most insulting question I get from, from people when I meet them is, um, well, what next? You know, well, what are we going to do now? Okay, they want to like rush to judgment. They want to, they want a quick answer. And every survivor I meet, every always tells me the same thing. They talk about, you know, that they're still on a healing path. They, 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 they're still stuck in this stuff. And if you have to deal with them on a professional basis. You could see it and you could understand it. I, I'm not negating it. I'm yeah. just asking for a yeah. balance, and a, a, yeah. a fair, yeah. you know, because uh, there were people who were very committed, and the literature is there, and yeah. so on. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And to me, it's just that it seems to be very, um, two, two wrongs yeah. don't make a right. No. That's, that's my point. No, I hear, I hear you. I hear you. But, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I didn't hear enough of those stories. You know what I mean? I'm sorry, I'm sure there are many stories like that too. I've heard from predominantly, you know, the bad stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, we mustn't forget that. We must no. not forget the real pain in Indian country. Mm -hmm. Okay. We gotta understand that. Okay. So uh, I don't like to speak to the trauma uh, that occurred in the country the same or same way, same way, same or same way, my own. My only point is I also understand the trauma in Shoulder. I understand the trauma across the when the hydro correct up the dam and basically messed the whole place up. Um, I, all I'm saying is that there are a number of those issues out there and I think that they've got to be dealt with. Um, and the one government's going to deal with them will have to basically take a look at what it has to do with it. Right? It's really the point that I would make. On the, the issue uh, of Professor Siri, um, you're absolutely right. The, the, the social workers for communities have to be have to be trained so that they work. I don't. I I question in terms of the universities whether the universities are going to be able to train them here, or whether mm -hmm. or whether they're not going to be trained up there. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have to be online. Yeah. What the universities are going to have to do is it's fast. Yeah. respond to one of the questions in particular, but I'm going to turn slightly because I'm going to be in trouble with the moderator because I'm going to break the rules and ask you one more question because I see one of our young Indigenous students up here and I think that's an important voice that we need to hear in this conversation. So I wanted to hear your question.
Do you have an answer to suggest? <laughs> I'm not going to speak for him, but I do think I heard part of Mr. Martin's comments in one of the earlier questions talking about it isn't just about the challenges of the university within the university, but the role that the university has to play outwardly also. And maybe that's just your question is to add to the list of those things that need to be addressed. And I, I don't know if others want to speak to the point, I, but I took some liberty in hearing your questions. I think we need to hear I, I do want to respond to the question of the story of being positive or negative and just say that, you know, we, we gathered and recorded about 7,000 statements. That's a very, very, very big canvas, and the canvas is what it was. People said what they said. They were not told what they could or could not say. They were given broad guidelines, and the microphone was theirs. I will tell you that of the 1,500 or so that I personally attended to, very many of those included a generous positive component to that. Sometimes it was directed at the leadership of the schools and teachers, and sometimes it was directed to fellow students who were good to them, protected them. But many people did include positive elements and the friendships they formed. Many expressed uh, appreciation. Those who managed to get a good education, and not all did, we can't pretend otherwise. And we can't pretend that all the teachers were qualified, they were not. Um, and so um, it was a mix, and, and, and I hope that that is clear in our report because we do talk about that, and we talk about people who were positively um, contributing in the schools, um, include, uh, I know for sure, uh, because I was the one who pushed to make sure that that was in there, uh, one school where indeed the principal of the school uh, was an Order of Canada recipient nominated by his students. Um, so much was he regarded. So, but the balance is what the balance was, and, and I completely agree, um, with Professor Love, that um, the weight of it in terms of the work before us comes from those things that went wrong rather than from those things. That I think. I think to be fair to you, I think the media tends to capitalize more on on the negative and so on, and so you know we don't don't hear. I haven't heard too much of the pause of a positive that that's my point but if I may if we think about it we're engaged here in a national problem solving challenge and we don't have to solve things that are okay no no <laughs> so we are focused on the challenges because that's where the work is and that's where we yeah. need to put but our that attention that might account for the silence of these orders because now in turn they might feel that they are being treated unjustly. You see, that, 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 that so anyway. I, well, I came here this morning from an event in Ottawa where um, a very wide ecumenical circle of churches from all denominations stood up and spoke together about their endorsement of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and their pledges going forward. So I think we're at a very positive place in terms of where faith communities are committing themselves and uh, mm -hmm. the efforts that people are trying to do together. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. I think that you wanted to say something yeah, to the point. <coughs> Hi, I am uh, a survivor. I spoke to you, I think, yes, in, I re I recognize it. In, in Nova Scotia. And there were 16 of us in my family, and eight of us went in the residential school. And we came out of the school, none of us could barely read and write. So there was a, you know, there was a lot of teachers in there who um, probably were qualified and some weren't qualified. But a lot of the times, too, it was fear. How can you learn when you're living in fear and you're being terrorized and you're constantly being watched? They never told us, oh, you know, you could become a doctor or you could become a nurse. All we did was chores. Everything that was precious to me was taken away from me in that school. My language, my culture, my identity, my spiritual belief. And to be made ashamed of who I was. You tell me what happens to a people when you take every goddamn thing away from them. You explain that to me. All these years have gone by. I suffered in silence. 
And now here I am, I'm speaking my voice because I want people to hear my voice because I suffered so many years in silence. And I'm the only one in my family that can speak about it. The rest of my brothers and sisters, they won't go there. And that's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to share a little bit of my story. And I just want people to remember, I lost a lot. I lost my culture, my language, my ceremonies, my own personal identity. They gave me a number like I was an animal or something. To be an innocent little child of five years old. And I lost that, the innocence of being a child. I never played like other children should play. All I knew was rules, regulation, and the belt. That's what I learned. So that's all I have, I have to say. Yeah, well, Malali, and thank you. who might cordially invite to a reception being held at the Newman Center just down the road, 3484 uh, Peel Street. I hope to see many of you there if you can. Thank you. Good evening.